Good evening. I pray you are well and staying safe. Uh, we are continuing with our daily Bible study. We are in the book of John again, chapter 14, verse 27 through chapter 15, verse 7. Today is June 1st, 2020, Kalomina. Pray everyone has a wonderful month. So I'm going to ask you to pause your videos here to go get your Bibles. If you do not have your Bible, if you do not have a Bible at home, the link for the Bible reading today is in the same email as this video. So as it is the best thing to do is always to pray before we read the Bible. So I'm going to read to you again the prayer from the Divine Liturgy, which is the exact prayer we read right before we read the Gospel reading. Okay, Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Shine in our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind that we may comprehend the proclamation of your Gospels, instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that, having trampled down all carnal desires, we may lead a spiritual life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory, together with your Father who is without beginning, and your Holy Good and Light Praying Spirit, now and forever and for the ages of ages. Amen. So, again, we are reading from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 27, through chapter 15, verse 7. So let me begin with that reading. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So, what is the setting here? So this is pretty much, this is part of the discourse that takes place during the Last Supper. So this is John's account of the Last Supper. And he don't read about the dipping, the, the bread, the eating, taking this is my body, or taking this is my blood. It's not here. This is John's way of telling the story. And this is right before they leave for the Garden of Gethsemane. So to really pinpoint it where it is, it's still at the Last Supper. They're most likely still in the upper room where it begins and possibly leaving by the end of the passage. All right? And it's after Jesus predicts Judas's betrayal and after he predicts Peter's denial. Okay? So that's where we really pinpoint where we are. So the passage opens up with this beautiful line, which we see many times, all right, throughout all the Gospels. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. It's this, the notion of peace, right? In the upper room after his resurrection, on the Sunday of Thomas, we, Jesus comes into the, in the upper room twice, the same upper room. It says, peace be with you. Now he's saying, peace I leave with you, right? Meaning, Jesus is the source of peace. So he mentions his peace he leaves and is a peace of the world. Now, in other words, he doesn't give you the same peace that the world does. What is the peace that the world gives? What's the difference here? Like everything else in the world, the peace of the world is temporary. Okay? It's temporary. The peace 
in the world is easily taken away from you from distractions in the world. For instance, right? You can be feeling 100% one day, physically, I mean, okay? No sneezing, no coughing, you don't have any tummy aches, you're doing well, you've been working out, you're, you've got a good long couple of months of great health with no pains whatsoever, you're not even a headache, nothing, not a body ache, you're waking up in the morning, everything's just great, you feel great, and one day, you don't feel so well. And you, maybe you get a stomach virus, maybe you get a common cold, maybe bronchitis, maybe nothing serious, just something, and now you, you're distracted, right, from that peace that you had. That simple peace from your good health, right? You're, you're distracted, now you're like, oh, you might be distracted from now eating, taking care of your body. You might be distracted from taking care of other things around the house because you're not feeling well. Or maybe you're distracted from praying. And this is where the devil comes in. He uses those distractions. The regular, you know, life, right? He uses those distractions to tempt you. And those temptations are designed to keep you from focusing on God. Now, that's one example, right? With, with the peace from Christ, which allows us to live eternally in this life, beginning here, all right? It protects us from the distractions. If we're constantly praying all the time before those distractions happen, and there are distractions every day in life, okay? Every day in life, there are distractions. So when we're constantly praying, because St. Paul says pray unceasingly. Why does he say pray unceasingly? For this very reason. The moment we stop praying, the easier we're distracted. And the more that we're distracted, the easier we're tempted. And the more we're tempted, the harder it is to keep focusing on Christ, on God. So when Jesus gives us his peace, even through the distractions, we still remain peaceful. Right? If we're continually praying every day, and that's where we're at. That's where we're living in Christ, looking for his peace on a daily, continuous daily uh, uh, type of prayer, right? Where we're continually looking for that on a daily basis, never stopping. If we should get ill or an adverse situation should, should arise in our lives, the peace of Christ remains with us even though these adverse situations pop up. And even adverse Adverse situations in this world are temporary. But if we look for the peace of the world and not for peace from Christ, guess what happens? We will live eternally in adversity, away from God. That's not how we want to live. Not forever. So just like everything else in this world is temporal, right? The water from the well, this was the Samaritan woman, the bread and fish that Jesus multiplied to feed the thousand. The light, right? All that's temporary. The peace of the world is temporary. So that's what Jesus is saying. My peace I leave with you. So you don't have to look for the peace of the world. It's my peace that you need. My peace you should seek. Okay? So now, further on, Jesus says in verse 30, and let me just start with verse 29. I, now I have told you before it comes that when it, does, when it does come to pass, you may believe. Okay? This is most likely referring to, we read this in an earlier chapter uh, of John, referring to Jesus' prediction of Judas and Peter. Okay? Because it didn't happen yet. He predicts it, and then they're going to know that he, he is who he say it, says he is. Right here, verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. So I want to just, the reason I wanted to kind of point this out, underline this, this verse here, is to kind of just kind of show you how we know kind of where Jesus is at now. Right? So the, the previous events from a few days before, chronologically speaking, are the raising of Saturday, the raising of Lazarus, Jesus, Jesus' entrance into the kingdom, into, into Jerusalem, as a king on Palm Sunday, and now we're at the Last Supper. And it's following the prediction of Judas' betrayal again, following Peter's denial, the prediction of that. 
and it's most likely at the very end of the Passover meal in the upper room in Bethany. Okay? So what's about to happen now, in a few hours from this point, Jesus is about to be arrested. And he won't be able to speak to them. This is a very literal here. John is saying, look, I'm, John's writing this and saying, saying, Jesus is saying this because, look, I'm going to be arrested now because he's told them all this before. Now it's happening. What I've told you before is about to happen. Pay attention so you know who I really am. In case you had any doubts, now watch. Because I've done all these beautiful miracles, I've taught you all these wonderful words, and now I'm about to show you that, I, you know, everything I've told you is going to happen. All my predictions are going to come true. Right? So, Jesus now is pointing out, or John, I should say, is pointing out this one little thing here that by saying I'm not going to be able to talk with you much longer, what Jesus is referring to is that he's about to be arrested and about to be crucified. So he won't have time to talk to them until after the resurrection, which we know that that happens later, right? So when he says the ruler of this world, all right, is coming, there's nothing in me. The devil is about to now take advantage of this situation through Judas, right? Because don't think the devil hasn't been at work here. He's been at great work to, to try to destroy Jesus because the devil even kind of got the wool. He's not so much of a believer who Jesus says he is, right? So at this point, we can say most likely that this is the end of the Last Supper after the meal later on in the evening and they are about to leave the upper room. If you listen to the rest of that passage there, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father and as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. So we know that they're leaving. Have they left yet? We don't know. And this is what I want to get at this next part. We're really going to look at now. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So that it may bear more fruit. So we have this image of a vine. All right? And all vines grow branches. And in the case of grape vines, which produce wine, those branches produce grapes. They produce fruit. So... Before I go further into the image, I want to show you why Christ is using this image. Keep in mind now, in all the readings that we've done, there's always been something that Jesus uses to teach. Okay? Again, I call to mind, or I call to your attention, the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, the water. He uses the water that gives that you get thirsty from after you drink it. But he's now the water that gives life, that you never thirst. The bread from the feeding of the 5,000, he is the bread of life. The light from the, from the sunrise at the Feast of Tabernacles when he's teaching, that light will eventually set, it'll go back in darkness, but with Jesus, you'll always have light. So somewhere, whether it be at the upper room, okay, there could have been vines growing on the wall, some scholars have said that, they might have, implied, they might have thought that. Uh, there could have been on the table where they were eating, there could have been some of those branches that have some of the grapes that they made the wine out of or they were eating from them. And of course, now this could be another maybe little sign of the institution of the Eucharist here, right? Uh, with, you know, uh, this is my body, this is my blood. This could be another way of John kind of reiterating what just happened. It's also possible they already left the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and somewhere along the way they saw a vineyard. Nevertheless, Whatever he did, whatever he saw, whatever vine he saw to teach, to give this teaching, that's not what's truly important. I'm going to read this quote from St. John Chrysostom, who we know very well. Um, Yet the root requires care rather than the branches in being dug, dug about and cleared. Yet about this he saith nothing here, meaning John says nothing about this here, but all about the branches. John is only talking about the branches. John is only saying what Jesus is saying about the branches. Showing by doing this, 
John is showing, Jesus is showing that he is sufficient to himself. Christ is the vine, God is the vine dresser, and God is the one who takes care of the branches. All right? So Jesus is the source of this life, which the source of life produces the branches that produce the fruit, the good works, that God will, if he sees branches not doing that, through the sun, will pull them off, throw them into the fire, not producing fruit. Okay? So it's the, the image is beautiful. It's very clear that Jesus is a source of all life. He doesn't talk about the care that he needs. And the Father is not doing any care for the Son because they are one. They're, Jesus is the source of life as the Father is the source of life. So by Jesus saying, and John really pointing this out, that God's not taking care of me, he's taking care of the branches. He's saying that we know God's a source of life, so am I. He's showing, John is showing that they are one through Jesus' words here, right? So, to continue with the last thing, I want to talk about the fruits. The good fruit is this. First of all, to be a branch, to abide in the vine, you have to unite yourself with it, right? So you need to be united with Christ. And what does it mean to be united in Christ, right? To act like him, to have the common feelings, to have be merciful to other people, to be loving to other people, right? And to be willing to, I want to say it like this, to be willing to be crucified for other people, right? To deny, Paul says, to deny, to deny ourselves. What does that mean? Does it mean forget who you are? No, it means come second. Other people come first, especially people who, who have need. I always use this example. If you're, if you're somewhere and you see someone begging for money or for food, and all you have is a $20 bill on you, all right? You don't give them the $20 bill. That's not a fruit. You give them the $20 bill. It's not about the money. It's about the act. Because they have a more difficult time of getting, that 20, getting something to eat than you do. You may, not be able, you may have to skip that lunch that day, but guess what? You'll go home for dinner. Right? So you may be skipping one meal, they're skipping seven in a row. That's how you deny yourself. That's how you crucify yourself for other people. And that's one very minor example. All right? You have to be willing to do those things. To unite yourself, to abide in the vine, to abide in Jesus Christ. Okay? And what's the danger of not producing good fruits? Well, it's obvious. If you don't abide in the vine, if, you, if you're a branch not producing fruit, you look like a dead branch hanging, not doing anything, why would you be continue to be left on the vine to choke it, to choke the other branches? So God will not allow that branch to have life anymore, eternal life. But through our actions, because we're not producing the fruits that we need to be doing, Again, it, it, this is not something that really happens like that. We don't. It's usually not a conscious thought. Could be, but it's not always that way, right? Sometimes we forget, and then we forget again. We forget about God. Not good. From the time of our baptism, the chrismation, when we're sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the, through the, the, the sacramental life of the church, we cultivate Christ's peace. We cultivate ourselves as branches, producing fruits. From that time on, if we don't continually pray to stay focused on God, if we don't continually pray to keep communicating with God, if we don't continue to pray to stay in communion with Him, we will forget about him because of the distractions of this world. And the devil will use those distractions against us to keep us from Christ, to tempt us even more, so we keep turning away from Christ. And then the more we forget him, we forget about him, we forget everything about him, we forget what he looks like, what he sounds like, what he feels like. We become a dead branch. God can't use us. 
doesn't help the vine. We're thrown into the fire. So the image of the vine here was a very, one of the last images that Christ uses as a teaching tool. There's other, some other things, but it's beautiful. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you will continue to produce good fruit and let Jesus be the source of your peace and your life. May God bless you always. Have a beautiful evening. Remember, God loves us all. Good night.